Hey folks, today is July 4th, Independence Day, and we have some great content coming up for you. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Do you like your web history being seen and sold to advertisers? No? Me neither. Get ExpressVPN right now at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Well, it is Independence Day, and unfortunately, it seems like the main principles of Independence Day have either fallen out of favor with a large segment of the American population, or just a lot of people don't even know what the principles of July 4th are. Joining us on the line to discuss is Ian Rowe, resident fellow at American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on education and upward mobility. He's also a writer for the 1776 Unites campaign. Ian, thanks so much for joining the show. Great to talk to you. Great to see you again, Ben. Happy July 4th. You too. So let's talk about the meaning of July 4th and why it seems to have fallen out of favor. It's it's very weird that if you look back at the history of how July 4th has been perceived, even people who were living under the evils of slavery or had escaped the evils of slavery understood what the principles of July 4th were supposed to be about. They just protested that those principles had not been properly extended. I'm referring here particularly to Fred, Frederick Douglass, who made a famous speech about yeah. the meaning of, of July 4th. And yet now we live in 2022. Black Americans have not just the same legal rights as all other Americans. In some ways, there are policies that actually are deliberately designed to favor black Americans. And yet we're told that now the Declaration of Independence's principles are not universal, were not universal, and Frederick Douglass was apparently wrong in seeking to universalize them. Yeah, that's highly problematic. I mean, on days like July 4th, this is an annual opportunity to reaffirm uh, the great elements of America, the, the, the values, the institutions around faith, family, hard work, free enterprise, entrepreneurship, those are the institutions, those are the pillars of our society that people of all races have embraced for generations. And it is true that, yeah, far back in the past, we had laws that banned certain people from moving forward. But embedded in America, I mean, de Tocqueville talked about this, we have the tools of self-betterment, self-renewal, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, all of the amendments. So it's unfortunate, I hear you, that there's a narrative that somehow the American dream is no longer accessible. But I got to tell you, Ben, I wouldn't say that um, uh, that's a, a, a feeling that all young people have, because I run schools for a living. There are a lot of young people that still believe in this country and still believe in the sense of possibility of what can exist. The key is that we actually create schools, we create institutions that reaffirm that for young people so they have proof positive to have something to counteract this sort of negative counter narrative. So Ian, just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the new national holiday of Juneteenth, which was really celebrating the end of slavery, even though technically slavery wasn't over in the United States until December of 1865. It celebrates when uh, former slaves in Texas found out that they had been freed by the end of, of the Civil War. So, you know, the, a lot of people read that, I think, properly as a as a fulfillment, Juneteenth, of the promises of the Declaration of Independence. A lot of people treated it as almost a rebuttal to the Declaration of Independence. Some people saying that Juneteenth ought to be treated as more valuable than Independence Day. What do you make of the sort of mesh between the two holidays and how they interact? Well, you know, Juneteenth certainly should be celebrated as a, as a, a day of freedom, but it's not a rebuttal of the Declaration of Independence. It's the it's the fulfillment. It's it's the evidence that we as a country made some huge mistakes, but over time fulfilled the promise of the original founding values of the country. And this is why it's so important that young people grow up in a society learning that they live in a good, if not great, country that can actually be an ally to helping achieve their dreams, as opposed to what many people seem to be saying is that somehow America is, is a hostile, is hostile to your dreams. I mean, I've just written a whole book called Agency, which is about empowering the rising generation to overcome the victimhood narrative. That there are certainly every person in a country is going to face certain barriers, but with the supports of strong families, strong faith-based organizations, strong school choice, those are the elements that can, if young people embrace, you can start to benefit from all the elements of our country, our free enterprise system, the opportunities for um, entrepreneurship, to build wealth. This is an optimistic society. We need to prioritize hope and agency over grievance and dependency. Now, Ian, in your new book, 
which again is titled Agency, the four-point plan for all children to overcome the victimhood narrative and discover their pathway to power. You talk about these, these four important passages, family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. It seems like all are under attack, and they are all under attack right now, actually, from a woke crowd that suggests that there's something racist about the things that you're saying, that there's actually something discriminatory about upholding the value of these fundamental institutions of Western civilization and, frankly, fundamental institutions in just basic successful life. Why do you think that there's been this push from the woke left to racialize what ought to be the most obvious features of a successful life? Yeah, it's very cloudy thinking. And you know what's interesting? I think it starts with a rejection of the individual as opposed to an obsession with identity group. So if you look at a lot of the woke ideology, a lot of it just focuses on, you know, racial differences by group or, you know, just group disparities, never acknowledging the role of the individual or those institutions that are most influential in shaping the, the possibility for an individual. And those institutions include family is fundamental, faith-based organization, religion, educational school choice. And if you have those, that then creates the foundation to become entrepreneurial for, for work and finding your own, building your own sense of wealth. And I think it's this conflict where group identity somehow necessitates trying to break down the institutions that are so important to shape an individual. And I think those of us who have benefited from knowing that, you know, we can't make it, we can't pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We've all benefited. Strong families, strong faith-based organizations, strong education. We have to stand in support of these institutions. America is actually a free, a self-governing free society. But the only but it's not guaranteed. We have to fight for the institutions that make America this incredible place. So the woke crowd, I think, is disillusioned. It's actually really frustrating when you see many of the woke crowd actually capitalizing on the, the they're benefiting and yet they're attacking the very institutions that they themselves have benefited from. So, Ian, let's talk about the the original meaning of July 4th. So this has been an issue of high controversy since the earliest days of the Republic as to, as to what the founders meant when they wrote the Declaration of Independence. So there, there are people like John C. Calhoun who are arguing basically the same thing that you now see woke people arguing, which is that the Declaration of Independence was always a racist document. It was meant to be a racist document. It was meant to exclude Americans. It was never meant to be universalizing. Uh, John C. Calhoun argued that in defense of slavery. Now, today, you have people arguing that in defense of tearing, tearing away at the kind of universal principles of the Declaration of Independence. What's the, in what way should we view the founding fathers, given the fact that they both were speaking on behalf of universal principles, and then many of them in their same person were, were actually standing for slavery in their own personal life, the most obvious example being the actual author of the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, you know, this is partly why I run schools. You know, these are, these are nuanced discussions to have, but I think it's important that young people and all Americans understand that there's a distinction between the ideals and the principles that the framers laid out that our country should always aspire to achieve and the imperfections of, of, of individuals that may not have always lived up to those ideals. And that, you know, the pursuit of a more perfect union is what I think makes arguments like that very frustrating. It's like you're, you're, you're mixing these two things, which is what is the, the, the ideal versus what is sometimes human frailties along the way to achieve those ideals. Um, de Tocqueville said, you know, the greatness of America is not that it's more enlightened than any other nation, it's that it has the ability to repair her faults. That's a really powerful statement, not only for the country, but each of us as individuals. So I reject this notion that the document itself was racist. No, the principles themselves are beautiful and universal and you're right, they didn't, the, the actual people at the time didn't live up to the expectation, but we're always striving to be better. We have the ability to repair our faults. Well, Ian, I, I want to ask you about uh, the, where you think the future of the country is going on July 4th. So you, know, you talk about these, these four major pillars of society and of personal decision-making, family, religion, education, entrepreneurship. I mentioned that, that all four seem to be under attack these days. Family is under attack. We have 
incredibly high rates of single motherhood, absent fathers. Yep. In terms of religion, we're now at the lowest rate of belief in God in the United States, I believe, that we've ever been in. Uh, and it's particularly low among young Americans. When it comes to education, our educational system failed us so badly that we now have essentially a parents revolt at the local level to take back control of their of yep. their local schools. And entrepreneurship uh, is being set upon by th this basic idea that government should both subsidize and, and, and regulate. So are, are you optimistic about a reversal of these trends or do you think these trends are going to continue? I'm always optimistic. And again, I run schools, so I it's, in, it's an inherently optimistic enterprise. And America is actually based on this idea that we have to take control over our own future. That's why I've written this book, Agency. You just mentioned the parents' revolt. It's actually an incredible example of why America is special. So a long time, public education honestly has, even pre-COVID, you know, only 37% of kids of all, you know, all races are reading at grade level in our country. And this was kind of persisting. COVID occurred. Parents got more visibility into seeing what was happening in schools. Schools were shut down. The woke agenda started to infiltrate. And now you're seeing more and more and more parental involvement saying, hold on. This is not what I signed up for my children. And I think, and I think even areas of religiosity, you know, I'm advocating for, uh, for much stronger families to reduce the non-marital birth rate. So I think there are more and more Americans realizing we actually have to fight for our country. Maybe in a way we've all became too complacent. And frankly, things are pretty good. And it's not until you actually see the potential loss of what is so valuable that we all start to say, okay, this is America. We don't have to go in this direction. We can be stronger. So I'm very optimistic. And again, I run schools. Young people inherently, regardless of their current situation, want to know the pathways to their own sense of prosperity and possibility. So I'm very optimistic. So let's talk about what you do in terms of schooling. So the, the 1776 Unites campaign is an, an attempt to create a curriculum that is broadly applicable. And then you also have founded schools yourself. You're the co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies. There are a lot of us who, who privately school our kids, who homeschool our kids. What's the way that you think parents should be approaching the education of their kids these days, given you know the problems with the public school system? Well, it's a very good question. So if you're a parent of, a, of, of you know elementary, middle, or high school, this is not a, you know, just drop your kid off and see you eight, you know, eight hours later. You have to be actively engaged in your child's education. What are they learning in school? Who's on your school board? What are the kind of policies that are being developed? And I think more and more parents have sort of took that for granted for a long, long time. But now you suddenly see, you know, start to see books um, in schools that are, you know, racially essentialist, who are, you know, literally writing that, you know, if you're white, you're an oppressor. If you're, if you're uh, black, you're oppressed. These things called privilege walks are happening in schools where all these artificial assumptions being made. But guess what? You have the power. And I think schools have to recognize that they are, you know, they're not the ones 100% responsible for kids. This is a partnership. But ultimately, parents decide. So, if you're a parent. Um, you know, who's on your local school board, consider running for school board yourself, join the committees that are that help govern your school, have more visibility into what's happening, be more engaged, period. Well, that's Ian Rowe. You can check out his brand new book, Agency, the four point plan for all children to overcome the victimhood narrative and discover their pathway to power. Ian, really, thanks so much for the time. Have a wonderful Independence Day. Yeah, thank you. Happy birthday, America. Well, folks, we talked with Ian Rowe about the ideals behind July 4th. But I thought it'd also be fun to talk to somebody who started a great American business producing American flags, actually. And so that's why I thought it'd be fun to talk to Katie Lyon. She and her husband purchased their first home. And when they did, they were trying to figure out exactly how they could find a really nice American flag. And it turns out that all of the stuff that they could find actually was really bad. It was made with subpar quality. And so they decided to take matters into their own hands. And that's how they launched Allegiance Flag Supply in Charleston, South Carolina in 2018. Katie, thanks so much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. Ben, thank you so much for having me. So why don't you tell me about, you know, what exactly caused you to, to start the company? Because it's not every day that somebody just starts a company to produce American flags. <laughs> no, it is not. And you know what? Thank goodness. <laughs> you know, we, we were... Um, Wes and I, my husband, like you mentioned, and our best friend, Max Barry, 
we bought homes um, right around each other, right at the, around the same time. And we're proud patriots. And we wanted to fly an American flag off of our houses. And the three of us really did come up with the same problem. We couldn't find an American flag that would last the elements, uh, stand up to mother nature um, in the amount of time that we thought that it should. Um, and most importantly, American flag that was made in America. Um, every American flag, every purchase is an emotional purchase. Um, and, and we felt like it was such a commodity. You know, you just buy this piece of fabric, you can buy it on Amazon from dealers and from different countries. And it was like, you know, why, why not um, create an American flag that really supports American jobs, supports military organizations, and um, really um, taps into the things that we believe in as Americans. So you started the company just a few years ago in 2018. You're making the entire thing in the United States, producing American jobs. How big is the company now? So we start, like you said, we started in 2018. We um, we kind of saw some crickets there for a little while. I think we went and we built the Rolls Royce of the American flag just to kind of break a little bit more than even. We had to charge $225 and each flag would take eight hours to make. Um, once we kind of honed in our craft and, and really we still make them handmade, they are not spit out of a machine. They're still the highest quality American flag. But once we kind of got our storytelling down, we got our materials down, um, that's where we really started taking off. And it was in 2020, right as the pandemic hit. And um, since then, um, we started in West and I's garage. And now um, we support in Charleston about <laughs> today, 28 American jobs and around the country over 50. That's amazing. And, uh, and y you had sort of an interesting journey toward uh, how you actually found a factory, because it turns out that the way you actually make your flags is very different from, as you mentioned, the way that most other people make their flags. You, apparently, you, because you use sewing, you do all this stuff by hand, there aren't that many people who are actually qualified to do it. It's true. And it's really, it's American textiles. I mean, as we know, they went overseas in the 80s. It's very, it's a, it's a labor pool that is not very strong to begin with. So um, we're always looking for craftsmen. I mean, we truly call them artists. What they're doing is a set of skills that I, you know, I can't do. Um, and, and so to really be able to revitalize that is so important to us. And, um, and it's so appreciated in the, in that community as well. So obviously the, the American flag, uh, has become much more of a controversial symbol over the course of the last few years. Uh, and yet you've seen your revenue go up. You've seen massive growth. How much do you think that that is a result of the controversy itself and people just finally sort of resonating to the idea that it's actually a political statement now to have an American flag, unfortunately? You know, I actually, I, I do believe that that has, in a way, boosted sales because at the end of the day, when everything is politicized, you're really forced to ask, you know, what do I believe in? And then really at the end of the day, what you're asking is what kind of American am I? And that's patriotic. You know, that at the end of the day, if you're forced to look at yourself and say, what kind of American am I? Am I? Um, and everything today is politicized, good or bad. Um, but that really puts in the forefront America. And there are some people that absolutely love to fly the American flag. And uh, we're our, the growth of allegiance. Um, certainly proves that uh, patriotism is alive and well. well. One of the things to mention about your company is that uh, you're supporting the military community. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so um, the month of May was a military appreciation month. Um, every week in May, we supported a different nonprofit, military nonprofit, and gave back in really creative ways. They came up with some great ideas of, um, you know, you buy a flag, we give a flag to a military organization, um, and, and that they facilitate that and give it to a military family, um, with holds of honor. We work with boot campaign. We really work with some incredible organizations. Um, and just like, uh, just like the three co-founders, Max West and I, our customers love to support military organizations. So when they feel like they can buy the highest quality American flag, supporting American jobs, and then, then they can also support the military while doing that as well. Um, everyone, everyone that we speak to really gets behind that. Well, that is Katie Lyon. She is one of the founders of Allegiance Flag Supply in Charleston, South Carolina. You can go check them out today and get yourself a nice American flag for 4th of July. Their website is showallegiance.com. Again, that's showallegiance.com. Katie, great to talk to you. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate being on. I really do.
Well, I hope that you're having a wonderful Independence Day celebration. So remember the values that are promoted by people in this country, ranging from Ian Rowe to Katie Lyon. I mean, there's a place of entrepreneurship and a place of patriotism, and those two things are deeply connected. The values of the Declaration of Independence are, in fact, eternal, and they do apply to all Americans. And the fact that that is even a remote point of controversy in today's America is sad for our country, but we can reinstill those values every time we wave a flag on Independence Day. There are actual studies, and what they tend to show is that if you take your kids to an Independence Day parade, that kid will end up a lot more conservative over the course of their life. So spend the day re-inculcating those values with family, reminding your kids what the Declaration of Independence was all about, reminding your kids that independence from Britain meant the explosion of freedom, not just in the United States, but all over the world the explosion of entrepreneurship and free market capitalism and free speech and all the values that we hold dear in this country. I hope you have a wonderful July 4th and we'll see you soon.